Well, we're finally here. It feels like we've waited forever since the conference finals have ended, but it's time for the 2015 NBA Finals. The Eastern Conference champion Cleveland Cavaliers versus the Western Conference champion Golden State Warriors. And what I set out to do in this video is give you my best stab at a 2015 NBA Finals preview. I'm going to talk about each of the two teams and their path to get to this point, talk about some of the keys for potential victory in this series for both the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers, and then give you my ultimate predictions on how I expect things to play out and how I expect this series to shake down and who will ultimately be hoisting that Larry O'Brien trophy. Let's start first with the Golden State Warriors. We're talking about a team that had a, you would almost say, historic type of regular season. I don't think this is something that's been talked about nearly enough. And sometimes in the NBA, it's such a star-driven league that sometimes the accomplishments of the team can most certainly be overshadowed. And with an MVP like Stephen Curry, and you're talking about another great all-star caliber player in a Clay Thompson, it's easy to focus on those guys. They're entertaining, exciting style of play and forget the fact that this is a really good team. A team that went 67 and 15 in the regular season, including 39 and 2 at home. I mean, they only lost two home games all year. They won 67 games in the regular season. That's one of the best regular seasons for a team in NBA history. That can't be overemphasized enough just how good this team was consistently all throughout the 2014-2015 NBA regular season. I mean, 67-15 and 15 is something. With all the focus on the MVP, Stephen Curry, and Klay Thompson, the Splash Brothers, I understand that. You know, this was just a really good team, and more than just an offensive team. This was a team that could do other things. This was a team that really improved its team defense this year to the point where they could be a, considered a real championship contending team. And you look at how they did in the playoffs. They got they were able to get by the Pelicans in a four-game sweep, and they had a bit of a battle there with the Memphis Grizzlies in the second round who were able to slow them down and physical them down low a little bit, at least early on in the season before they ended up prevailing in six games. And then they ended up beating an undermanned and, frankly, a little bit overwhelmed at that point in time Houston Rockets team in five games. So, you know, it's not that much of a surprise to me frankly, that the Golden State Warriors got to this point. Because as you watch this team throughout the season, I think it became clear to most everyone, uh, especially if you didn't have a rooting interest or a dog in the fight in the Western Conference, that this was the best team in the Western Conference, if not the NBA, and to be an absolute upset and totally stunning surprise that they didn't make it to this point. But what was it that really helped them get here? Well, you look at the Golden State Warriors, and this is a team that's been built primarily through the NBA draft, something that is rare to say in today's NBA. With the love of going out there and making trades and big-time free agent acquisitions, you know, when you see over the years teams like Boston and how they were built with Allen Pierce and Garnett, you look at the Miami Heat with LeBron and Wade and Bosh. Now here's a team that pretty much has built the majority of their roster, in particular their stars, the meat and potatoes of their roster, through the NBA draft. You go back to 2009, they got Steph Curry with the seventh overall pick. The seventh overall pick was the league MVP this year. Think about that. And then in 2011, they were able to get Klay Thompson with the 11th overall pick. So they got two all-star caliber players, two of the very best in the game, including this year's MVP, and neither one of them was a top five pick. In the case of Clay Thompson, he wasn't even a top 10 pick. Then you go to the next year's draft in 2012. They get Harrison Barnes in the first round and Draymond Green, who's been a godsend for them, with the second round pick. So not only were they able to draft those players and develop them and keep them within their organization, but you're able to do it at a cheaper cost, you know, in the case of a Draymond Green, you still haven't had to pony up the dough for him, although they most certainly will have to in this offseason. There's something to be said about that natural chemistry and continuity that comes along with being able to draft these young guys and build your team with them working together over a period of time. But things really didn't start to fully fall into place until this organization made a surprising move last offseason by firing Mark Jackson and bringing in Steve Kerr. 
And that was really the move that I think that really helped to piece everything together. It's not so much a slight against Mark Jackson. It was just that Steve Kerr was the right man for the job, and honestly, he's done a hell of a job. So it's really not a surprise for the Warriors. Now, on the Cavaliers' uh, standpoint, they're a little bit different. You know, you could see maybe because of the fact they played in the Eastern Conference, because they had the best player in the East and probably for sure the best player in the NBA, LeBron James, you could envision a path for them to get to – not only the playoffs, but ultimately this destination, the NBA Finals. But it wasn't looking good very early on. They hired Dave Blatt before they ever brought, were able to bring in LeBron James via free agency. So you bring in one guy to coach one type of team, and then LeBron James comes in, and the whole dynamics of it are all off. And, and that's the truth of the matter. And at one point in time, it was looking really ugly. You had LeBron was out with injury. This Cavs team was under 500 about midway through the season. Uh, but then they started to find themselves. They started to really, I think, figure out how to kind of play with each other, you know, especially trying to figure out how Kevin Love would fit into the mix. And they ended up finishing 53-29. and 29. They won their division. They had the second-best record in the Eastern Conference. Then they got to the playoffs, and frankly, the Cavaliers have looked pretty good in the playoffs. Even with the Kevin Love injury at the end of that Celtics series, they had, didn't have him for the Bulls series, the Hawks series. They're not going to have him again for the NBA Finals. They swept the Celtics. They beat the Bulls in six. And they were able to sweep the team with the best record in the Eastern Conference, the Atlanta Hawks. You know, this has been a curious road. And I would also almost say, frankly, that the Cavaliers, for my money, in my opinion, are better off because they don't have Kevin Love. And I know that's going to be considered blasphemy by many, but you look at it, and they don't have to worry about how to try to fit Kevin Love in. And what he was really bringing to the table was not necessarily what I felt that team really needed. You almost wonder sometimes if they maybe would have been better off just keeping an Andrew Wiggins as opposed to trading for a Kevin Love. But once Kevin Love went out, this team had to adjust. They became a more perimeter-based team, especially uh, finding more playing time for guys like J.R. Smith and Iman Shumpert. It allowed Tristan Thompson more time on the floor. I frankly, honestly feel that the Cavaliers are more of a legitimate championship contending type of team because Kevin Love is out of the lineup as opposed to if he was still in there and they were trying to figure out how the pieces all fit together. But how did this Cavs team really get here in terms of the building of this team? You honestly have to go back to the decision of 2010. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because you have LeBron James go to Miami, take his talents to South Beach, and it leaves the Cavaliers in a terrible spot. So they play that 2010-2011 season. They have one of the worst records in the league. They because of the fact that LeBron wasn't there and they were trying to prepare for the future and clear out salary cap space, they were able to pull off a deal with the Los Angeles Clippers where they took Baron Davis in a contract dump and got a first-round pick along, along with that. And the significance of that was in that 2011 draft, that Clippers pick ended up being a lottery pick. Furthermore, since the Cavaliers owned the rights to it, it ended up being the number one overall pick. So they had the number one overall pick, and then they ended up with the number four overall pick, and that allowed them to get Kyrie Irving out of Duke and Tristan Thompson out of Texas. So that really helped in terms of planting the seeds eventually at some point in time for a potential LeBron return. Now, this is also a team that got helped by the luck of the draw when it comes to the lottery, getting you know the number one overall pick for guys like Anthony Bennett and Andrew Wiggins. And you might laugh about Anthony Bennett, but he was a guy that they were able to package along with Wiggins in order to go make the Kevin Love deal. You know, In some ways, the best thing that happened to that Cavaliers organization in 2010 was LeBron leaving because they had reached a point in time where they were kind of maxed out from a salary standpoint. They weren't going to have high lottery picks. Uh, they were going to continue to tread water and only get to a certain point, not be able to take that next step and get to that next level. Now, with LeBron leaving, it allows you to do some other things as an organization, bring in some other young pieces at a cheaper cost. So that way, in a few years later, you're able to bring LeBron back and everything tends to work out. Obviously, LeBron's return back home, so to speak, most certainly helped. But that's not all. What really made the difference for the Cavaliers this year were two trades that they made in the middle of the season. And this was critical for them. One, being able to get J.R. Smith and Amon Shepard from the Knicks. That was critical to them. They needed um, wing scorers. They needed guys that could shoot. They needed guys that could defend, and being a combination of J.R. Smith and Iman Shumpert, they got exactly what they got. They got two guys, frankly, that could play with LeBron. And, you know, for me, a guy like J.R. Smith 
fits perfectly with a guy like LeBron because, frankly, LeBron is a champion. J.R. Smith can't sit there and do some of the shit that J.R. Smith wants to do. He's going to know that there's an alpha dog and it's not him, and he's going to have to toe the line. And that helps. So now J.R. Smith can bring more of the positives that a J.R. Smith can bring to the table. And then in Mount Shumpert, a young athletic wing defender who could do some things on the offensive end. He can shoot. He can occasionally create his own shot. I mean, being able to bring in those guys, and then on top of that, bringing in a guy like Mozgov via trade, bringing them that low post presence that they really weren't going to get out of Kevin Love, frankly, and they didn't have because of Vera Zhao's injury, you know, those trades were critical to the Cavs getting to this point. And you look at the playoffs, especially guys like J.R. Smith and Iman Shumper. And as much as we want to talk about LeBron or you talk about a guy like a Matthew Della Vadova, the simple fact of the matter is the Cavaliers might not be in this spot if they don't make those trades in the middle of the season. In fact, I guarantee they wouldn't be because you look at the competition contributions, excuse me, especially from guys like J.R. Smith and Iman Shumper, and it's easy to see just how much of a difference they made and why the Cavaliers were able to get to this spot. Now, when I look at this series, I do envision ways that both the Warriors and the Cavaliers can win, even though I think that, for all intents and purposes, the Warriors are the favorite. And once you get past the fact that Cleveland has LeBron, you almost have to look at the Warriors as big favorites. I, I look at the Warriors, and here are some of the keys to me for them for success and ultimately victory in this series. Uh, you got to keep your offense up tempo. You've got to force the Cavs to speed up. The Cavs aren't as deep of a team as the Warriors are. They don't quite have the same amount of skill as the Warriors do. You know, the Warriors to me can do more in terms of being able to play different styles in different ways. Although Memphis was able to successfully slow them down and physical them a little bit down low and that did mess up the Warriors for a little bit before they ultimately found their rhythm and found a way to figure out to beat them. But to me the Warriors have to keep running. They have to keep their offense up tempo. To me for the Warriors their quality shot is the first open one they get based off of some of the skill that they have. In terms of from a defensive standpoint they've got to use clay Draymond Green, Harrison Barnes, Andre Iguodala as a steady rotation on LeBron defensively. No one of them is going to shut down LeBron. Frankly, the combination of all four of them is not going to shut down LeBron. But what they can do is they can use up to 24 fouls to potentially defend the guy. Furthermore, these are four guys that could at least competently defend LeBron, bother him with their length and in some cases their size and their strength, athleticism. You can make LeBron work on the offensive end and you can make him frankly work on the defensive end as well with guys like Klay Thompson and Draymond Green and Harrison Barnes especially. You know, there are times where I think it will behoove the Warriors in this series to truly go with a small lineup where you're playing Draymond Green at the five, maybe you incorporate Livingston at the point, because in that case, you really don't have a place to hide LeBron. He's going to have to guard somebody. He's going to have to defend somebody. He's going to have to expend energy on both ends of the floor, similar to a Kyrie Irving. He's going to have to expend energy on both ends of the floor. And if you want to have success, if you're the Warriors defensively, one of the ways to do that, especially when it comes to LeBron and Kyrie Irving, is make them work when you're on offense. Make them work on defense. Drain more of their energy. Um, you've got to, I think, give some quality minutes again to Sean Livingston in this series. I think you saw, especially in that Houston series, just what type of impact a Sean Livingston can have. It allows Steph Curry to play more off the ball. It allows them to go even smaller, which can cause some mismatches with Klay Thompson playing at the three. Uh, Livingston really was an impact player for them as the playoffs continued, and I expect him to be so in these finals again, especially if the Cavs at times want to go with a smaller backcourt with both Irving and Della Vadova on the floor, you know, one of them would ultimately have to guard a Livingston. And while Livingston's not a world beater, he's that type of versatile threat that could cause the Cavaliers all types of problems on the defensive end, similar to what a Boris Diaw did for the Spurs against the Miami Heat, LeBron's guys last year. They just couldn't match up with Boris Diaw, and when they went with certain lineups, you know, everybody could handle the ball, everybody could shoot, everybody could move, uh, the Heat were sunk. And frankly, from the Warriors, I know sometimes the tendency is when you get to those pressure games, you get to the finals, you try to slow down, you try to, you know, play under more control. The Warriors have got to do what got them to this point. 
You won 67 games in the regular season for a reason. You're great offensively. You can do a lot of different things, especially when you're moving the basketball. You're a team that can competently defend. You're a team that can legitimately play 10 guys, maybe even 11, and not feel like you're dropping off that much, even when you bring in guys like Lee and Barbosa and Azili off of the bench. you got to do what got you there. Don't sit there and change things up now just because the pressure is the highest. If anything, that's when you should be most determined to continue to do things the same so that way the moment doesn't become too big because the one thing that this team does lack and it is a bit of a concern is championship experience now, sometimes the only way you get that is by winning a championship but that is a bit of a concern now let's look at the Cavaliers and how they can ultimately win in this series I think the first thing they've got to do is they got to be able to slow down the tempo if you're gonna sit there and get into a track meet with the Golden State Warriors you will lose period I mean, the Houston Rockets were going to try and, you know, boat race them and the Warriors quickly dispatched of them in five games. You cannot sit there, if you're an Eastern Conference team like the Cavaliers, who are lacking in depth, sit there and think that you can honestly go run with the Golden State Warriors throughout the whole series and think that that's going to be a formula for success. The Cavaliers have to try and impose their will. A lot of times that's what it's about. It's about pace and tempo and who can control it and dictate it. And for the Cavaliers, I think it's critical for them in this series that they slow down the tempo, that they make it more of an Eastern Conference basketball style of series. In particular, that means guys like Tristan Thompson and Timothy Mozgov are going to have to control the paint. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to play like world beaters, but Tristan Thompson has to provide some shot blocking down low. He has to continue to be a beast on the boards, especially if they're going to put a Draymond Green on him defensively, or even, let's say, an Andrew Bogut. Thompson has to own those boards, because that is one area where the Warriors can be had a little bit. They can be a little bit vulnerable on the boards due to their overall lack of size and lack of accomplished post players. So you've got somebody like Tristan Thompson, who is probably beyond question the best offensive rebounder in the NBA and one of the very best rebounders in the NBA. He has to be able to impose his will on the glass and as a shot blocker, be a presence down low to maybe deter guys like Curry and Klay Thompson from trying to get to the hoop. And then you look at a guy like Mozgov, I say he's got to control the paint. He's got to be more than just a stiff. He has to be able to make Bogut work, maybe try and get Bogut into foul trouble. If I was the Cavaliers, I might try to establish Mozgov a little bit, especially early on in the series, to try and sit there and throw the Warriors off and say you might have to contend with this guy a little bit. Mozgov might not be able to do it on a consistent basis throughout the series, but there are bits in Spurts, I think, where a Mozgov could sit there and impact you positively, especially on the offensive end. Because if you've got Mozgov doing something down low, it might open up things for Tristan Thompson on the offensive glass, but most especially of all, it's going to open things up on the perimeter for LeBron, for Kyrie, and then the guys like Della Vadova and Smith and Shumper. You look at LeBron and Kyrie, honestly, they got to be better than Curry and Thompson in this series. It's that simple. It's the Cavs' top two alpha dogs have to be better than the Warriors' top two alpha dogs. I could talk about slowing down the Temple and Thompson and Mozgov controlling the pain on both ends, but if LeBron and Kyrie can at least be as good, if not better, than Curry and Thompson, then there is no way in hell the Cavaliers are winning this series, period. Period. It's just not happening. One thing LeBron can bring to the table is championship big game experience in abundance. While sometimes he frustrates me because he's inconsistent with that killer instinct, he does have that ability and has demonstrated that at times. And he must consistently be on point with it and have it throughout this series. And when you look at a guy like Kyrie, now that he's had some time to rest and hopefully get healthy and be at full strength, he needs to be at full strength. He needs to be that guy. He needs to be that 1B to LeBron's 1A. Because if he's not, then Curry and Thompson will clearly be the better pairing out of this series, and it's going to be a rough go of it for the Cavaliers. And they need guys like Smith and Shumpert and Della Vadova to be big as they have been throughout the Eastern Conference playoffs. They need Della Vadova to be able to hit some shots, to be kind of that grinder, that kind of get-in-your-head type of guy. They need Smith and Shumpert to be able to space the floor, especially when you're going to try and post up LeBron, or you're trying to open things up for Kyrie on the dribble drive, or LeBron on the dribble drive. You need Smith and Shumpert to be able to contribute and they need to be able to hit some shots maybe be able to create their own shots be able to be that type of spark that at times the Cavaliers have been able to count on them to be in the playoffs when I look at this series 
you know, I sit there and I say, what LeBron has done has been incredible. Five straight years of getting a team to the NBA Finals. Yes, the first four times were with Wade and Bosch. Yes, he's done it in the Eastern Conference. But five straight years is five straight years. That's something that's special, and that's something that shouldn't be dismissed. You also look at the fact that this Cavaliers team isn't that great. It really isn't. Now, are they as bad as the 2007 version with such legends as Larry Hughes and Boo Gibson? No, they're not nearly that bad. And it's time for people to stop talking like this Cavs team is as bad as that 07 Cavs team that got swept by the Spurs in the finals. They're not. And if you think that, you're being ridiculous, honestly. But this is still not a great team. This is a team that has several holes, a lack of depth, a lack of a post score. You know, it, it, they have holes. They have issues. But they were still able to get there. And in large part, that is a reflection upon LeBron James and just the type of player, leader, competitor that he is. You know, but man, there's just so many things pointing to me that the Golden State Warriors are going to dominate this series. They're deeper. They can beat you in a multitude of ways. They can do more things on both the offensive and defensive end. I think, frankly, that their top two of Curry and Thompson is better than the Cavs' top two of LeBron and Kyrie when you put them together. And then when you factor in the superior depth for the Warriors and the different types of lineups that they can trot out there and at times that they can have five guys out there that can handle the ball, that can score, that can defend anybody on the floor, it's just too much for the Cavaliers. You know, while I was expecting it to maybe be next year before the Cavaliers got to the finals, they got there this year, and hats off to them. But I think the romance ends very quickly. I think the Warriors are just too much. They've been the best team all throughout the regular season, and I don't see any reason to think that anything other than them winning the NBA championship is going to happen. This is a team, again, that won 67 games in the regular season. They have the league's MVP. Uh, it's going to be the Warriors, and I'll say the Warriors in five. Out of respect to LeBron and Kyrie and Cleveland, I'll give them one game. But if the Warriors have any chance of losing this series and the Cavaliers have any chance of winning this series, the Cavaliers must win one of these first two games in Golden State, maybe even game one. If they can't do that, if they go down 2-0, it's going to get ugly very quickly. We'll ultimately find out. But for me, I just think the Warriors have too much. They can do too many things. They're just too good, and they're going to win this series in five games and be the 2014-2015 NBA champions.